Hello, bonjour, willkommen, konnichiwa, karibuni, satsuki akal, ni hao. The generators are on and the transmitter's been cranked up to full power with our one source of power, our ultimate discovery, which can only mean episode 20 of Awesome Astronomy is ready to give you another hour of astronomy news, views and opinions. We have planets, commercial space flights, exploding stars, another great competition from our friends at the European Southern Observatory, we explore the Kuiper Belt and our five minute concept, we have an astronomy travel report from Pakistan, and someone promised there would be answers if we stuck around. I'm Paul, and sitting next to me, just waiting and looking skyward, is of course, Ralph. Hey Paul, what a month January was, hey? Mmm. It's quite literally been stargazing season. The BBC put on their annual extravaganza, Stargazing Live, where we saw the Jodrell Bank Telescope spin off to analyse a distant galaxy that a member of the public found via gravitational lensing using Chris Lintott's Space Warp Citizen Science Project, and they had... Apollo astronaut Walt Cunningham and ISS commander Chris Hadfield talking about life in space. And how good was Carolyn Porco talking about a Cassini images from Saturn? Yeah, she was fantastic. A real pleasure to see someone who knows their subject and their work so well and, and knows how to communicate it to the public. And importantly too, I think uh, Stargazing Live gets this huge audience worldwide and gets ever more people interested in the hobby and the science of astronomy, which is what we're all about. Yeah, and, and coming back to Cassini, it, it was such a great mission to have such an advocate on their team. It must be a real bonus in these penny-pinching mm. times. Um, But away from the BBC's annual physics comedy tie-up, you've had a special astronomical January. So what's been keeping you up and scope bound over the last month? Well, there was the big gathering of the Baker Street Irregular Astronomers in Regent's Park again with clear skies over London to show new faces their first views of Jupiter, the moon, and the brighter deep sky objects. Uh, Which you missed. Which I missed, yeah. But with good reason, because I flew out to Iceland to see the Northern Lights and explore that wonderful volcanic and tectonically active country. And did you record a travel report? Oh, yes. So oh. I'll put up a report on the website with lots of pictures, and you can hear my audio journal in next month's show. So how did January pan out for you, Paul? Uh, well, I've been getting in some good dark sky time, hunting down faint galaxies, um, really trying to push the limit of a five-inch scope and averted vision. Um, then there's Jupiter. It's been a constant draw. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was really fortunate to actually be in Regent's <laughs> Park for the fantastic <laughs> meeting of our beloved Blake History Irregulars, um, which, as you said, it was part of the Stargazing Live Week in the UK run by the BBC. And we had one of the clearest skies I've seen over London. Um, and through the night, we had about 400 people come and share scopes. Mm. Chat astronomy and soak up what was really a really wonderful atmosphere. Sounds perfect. Yeah, it was. It was. Now, to take this further, it's time to join Damien as he reports from the dark, dark skies of Pakistan in the first of our awesome astronomy field reports. Hi, this is Damien. I've been able to slip Ralph and Paul's clutches for a quick bit of stargazing from a dark sky site in rural Punjab, Pakistan. It's 1am on New Year's Eve and quite cold here at the moment, but the sky is lovely and dark and I can clearly see the Milky Way stretching overhead. The seeing is rock steady with very little turbulence affecting the view. The first part of this evening's session was focused on M42, the Great Nebula in Orion. It's currently setting in the southwest, but it's still some 50 degrees high. The sail, sword and fish's mouth were all clearly defined and I was able to tease out some detail I hadn't noticed visually before. It's quite possibly the clearest I've seen it for some time. I'm currently looking at Jupiter, which is a neck-breaking 82 degrees in altitude from here, and I'm currently watching the great red spot making its transit across the disk. The main belts are also benefiting from the tranquil sky, with hints of detail coming through quite strongly. The real excitement for me, though, is a first glimpse of Mars in a few hours. It's visible now, low on the horizon, but it needs to get higher to be able to stand a chance of making anything out on the small disc it will be presenting. I haven't been able to see it from home for a little while, certainly not since I've been using a Maxitov telescope for planetary viewing. Following Mars will be Saturn, and it's very tempting to stay up a little bit later than I planned just to see if I can get an early peek at the rings. While I'm here, I'm also hoping to share the amazing views with some of the local people. Many have never had the opportunity to look through a telescope before, and during my last visit a year ago, I was privileged enough to be able to share some of the views of the Moon and Jupiter, which were met with a mixture of surprise, astonishment and excitement, despite the misty and foggy conditions. So I can't wait to show off M42, Jupiter, and some views of the Sun in these wonderful conditions to the local community. 
I hope that you're all enjoying the views from wherever you are, and I hope you have a great year ahead. Oh no! So, now on to the news, in what's been a busy month in the astronomy world, and first up, you're starting on the same topic that you left off with last month, exoplanets. Yes, a new exoplanet study and instrument, but I feel I should prefix this news story by mentioning that with more than a thousand planets outside our solar system now confirmed, and many more waiting for follow-up study and confirmation, it might surprise you to know that only 1.6% of those worlds have actually been seen. Only 17 exoplanets have been directly imaged. And that's because stars themselves only appear as a single point of light, a pixel across. Even in many of the world's largest telescopes, it's only the shimmering of the Earth's atmosphere that makes them appear as disks of light in astronomy images. So imagine how hard it is to spot a planet many times smaller than a star, which isn't emitting its own light and sits right next to the glare of its raging sun. Not easy at all. Well, the giant Keck telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope have the advantage of infrared vision, coupled with either being a huge ground-based telescope or being out in space, to help them see gas giant planets sitting in orbits quite a way out from their host star. But this is still a really difficult task, and it often requires a good degree of serendipity, pure good fortune and luck. But... Joining the hunt for directly imaging these distant worlds is now the new Planet Finder instrument operated by an international group from seven countries. This new instrument uses the 8.1 metre Gemini South Telescope in Chile and it's on the lookout for large gas giant planets. So this can be used for detecting large exoplanets, but it'll primarily be used to confirm their existence when inferred by other exoplanet hunting methods, and then probing the atmospheres of these planets. And it's interesting too that, and we were discussing this in the Hoagland Arms the other night, Mm. um, that the coronagraph technique developed in the 1930s to let us see the sun's corona, or the the plasma that surrounds the sun by blocking out the main glare, is now being used to let us see impossibly small dots really around impossibly small lights um an impossible distance away yeah i know it's hard to believe it's it's even possible to do this the separation between the planets and their stars are so small at those distances but by blotting out the light from these stars we can reveal planets many light years away by using an old solar astronomy technique and I remember they tried out this planet finder instrument on for the first time in november but we now have an image released by the team of beta pictoris b isn't it Yeah, this is an exoplanet um, 63 light years away that was imaged back in 2008 by ESO's very large telescope in Chile, but we now have another confirmation of its existence by this new instrument and some nice calibration data to get them excited and up and running. But this new Gemini Planet Finder instrument is so sensitive that it can also detect and inspect protoplanetary disks. They're the disks of gas and dust that circle stars in young solar systems which can coalesce to eventually form planets. Yeah, so we can see the beginnings of other solar systems and watch the stages of planetary formation with this instrument too. Yeah, that's right. And we already have an image from them of a protoplanetary disk around a young star 240 light years away. And it's a spectacular image in its own right without all the data that we're collecting here too. Yeah, and I love the comparison they use. It's like seeing a firefly circling a streetlight from 1,000 kilometres away. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. and it's all down to the sensitivity of sensors that uh, would have been unimaginable 20 years ago mm. and the relentless advancement of technology. You know, They say that already this instrument's better than its predecessors by a factor of 10 and they expect to get even more impressive results as they learn how to push the planet finder to its limits. Mm. So next up in the news, are we going to see a supernova? That's a good question. I don't know, but the Hubble Space Telescope last month spotted a star 20,000 light years away in the constellation Carina in the Southern Hemisphere. And it's an absolutely stunning image because it has a purple ring around it, which is the star's atmosphere floating away in a ring as it starts to die. But it's not the beauty of the object that's so newsworthy here. Almost every Hubble image is beautiful. But it's the fact that this star has similar properties to a star that became a naked eye visible supernova in one of our satellite dwarf galaxies in 1987. Now this star is 20 times larger than our sun and that means it'll eventually explode very violently to seed its surroundings with heavy elements like gold and lead, which will be the stuff that may become the metals in new planets that haven't formed yet. And as it's following the characteristics of the 1987 supernova just before it went pop, ESA and NASA astronomers think this is on the verge of going supernova too. 
but this star's eight and a half times closer than that naked eye visible supernova, so it should put on quite a show when it does suddenly explode. Yeah, and we should say it's not close enough to our solar system to harm us in any way, but it should be a spectacular sight, especially in the night sky to southern observers. And this time we have the Hubble to point at it in an array of amazing scopes, all things we didn't have in 1987. If it goes pop soon, this will be an exciting science. So the chances of it happening within our lifetimes, well, who knows, but the odds are better than Betelgeuse, our next best hope of a big supernova, and that we're all waiting to go pop any time in the next million years. Yeah, well, we'll keep an eye on those neutrinos. Um, after the 1987 event, it was realised there'd been a spike in neutrinos f- um, flowing through the world's neutrino detectors about three hours before the light from the explosion was seen. This time, of course, we have the supernova early warning system in place, which uses the world's neutrino instruments to give astronomers warning enough to get scopes pointing in the right direction. The Holy Grail is, of course, actually recording the whole event. So, from watching events in space to getting out there ourselves, is commercial spaceflight going to make us all astronauts yet? Well, not yet, but the signs are good, I think. Since manned spaceflight began in 1961, the only way anyone was getting into space was by becoming an astronaut. And let's not pretend the odds are good. Less than 600 people have flown in space, but commercial spaceflight aims to change that. And with companies like SpaceX, Virgin Galactic and Bigelow, they've all got different ambitions to get us into space or to help us stay there. But it seems like we've been talking about public access to space for years now and we're still (laughs) not there yet. So uh, while government funded stuff is surprising us all. Yeah, and that's always the way, though, isn't it? If a government can significantly bankroll a tricky endeavour, it stands a greater chance of success, I guess. But we can demonstrate this by comparing Virgin Galactic, which is almost entirely private funded, with SpaceX, which is getting NASA money to take access to low Earth orbit out of NASA's hands. And Virgin's been building up suborbital flights since 2004, where for a quarter of a million dollars, anyone can buy a ride into space that takes two hours from launch to landing and takes in six minutes of weightlessness. Now, the first flights were expected to commence in 2011, but they keep getting pushed back. Just last year, Richard Branson said he'd be on the first flight in December 2013. Well, that date's again passed by, and they're still doing test flights at 13 miles high. That's way below the Kármán line, this arbitrary altitude generally taken to be the start of space, which is 62 miles up, or almost five times higher than Virgin's highest altitude test so far. But undeterred, Virgin Galactic are saying 2014 is the year, so we'll wait and see. Yeah, I know lots of people would give their right arm for this trip. Is it something you'd want to do? I don't know. Suborbital just seems a bit too brief for me, but maybe once we no longer run the risk of being strapped to Russell Brand or Justin Bieber on one of those (laughs) early flights, the price may come down to a level where the general public can afford this as a luxury holiday. Maybe then I'd go instead of an Aurora or Total Eclipse holiday. But I don't know. What about you? Would you go for it? Mm, Maybe if Bieber was sick next to an airlock that I had the controls to. (laughs) Um, Seriously, though, I'm not sure. I'd love to get into space... uh, I think a bit more than a quick blast above the air. That, mm. that. Uh, but who knows? Maybe instead of that retirement cruise, that everyone seems to hanker after. I'd rather nail myself to a wall than go on one of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, like Virgin Galactic, SpaceX has always wanted to get the public in space, but it's decided to get on board with President Obama's directive that NASA should direct funds to push commercial space companies to take over ferrying supplies, satellites, and astronauts to low Earth orbit and the International Space Station. So far, SpaceX and the Orbital Sciences Corporation have sent resupply ships to the space station, due largely to the funding and milestones set by NASA. This year, they'll be set the goal of developing their resupply vessels to carry astronauts to the ISS in return for funding. This means that SpaceX and the other bidders for this commercial crew transportation program money are allowing NASA to concentrate on exploration beyond low Earth orbit while building up their own spaceflight capability at reduced cost. So once NASA's milestones have been reached in 2017, if everything goes to plan, the Sierra Nevada company, Boeing, Blue Origin and SpaceX will all have spacecraft ready for orbital flights to the paying public and Bigelow Aerospace are designing space habitats as orbiting hotels. So we're getting there slowly, but compared to the situation before 2008 when Virgin Galactic was really the only real gig on the horizon, it seems a whole lot closer to an actual choice of space destinations and providers now. Yeah, so again, I I guess we'll just have to see. Mm. Um, But from commercial spacecraft to dedicated astronomy spacecraft, the Europeans are gearing up for an exciting year. 
Yeah, they really are. The European Space Agency's Gaia spacecraft was successfully launched and entered its parking bay one and a half million kilometres from Earth in the second Lagrangian point in space, where it can sit without using too much rocket fuel to maintain its orbit and stare into the cosmos in the shade of the Earth. And if everything goes as well as it has so far, the mission should last five years and start giving us its first results in summer. And in this very good year for ESA, its Rosetta spacecraft was woken up on the 20th of January after being in a sleep mode for 31 months while it continued its decade-long chase of comet Churyumov-Gerasimenko. From now on, Rosetta inches closer to the comet, goes into orbit around it as it enters the inner solar system, starts mapping and characterising it in August, and sends down a lander in November this year. Now, the orbiter and lander are then going to surf the comet around the sun, collecting information and images for us to learn so much more about these fragments left over from the birth of the solar system. It's up there with curiosity in terms of technology and engineering that's being used. Uh, It's really cutting-edge science. Uh, I just hope it works, Mm. Uh, mainly for the science, but also for the idea of a probe surfing a comet. It's just so damn cool. That is (laughs) so cool, isn't it? Mm. But the sad news this month is that John Dobson, the pioneer of the Dobsonian mount, died in January, aged 98. Dobsonians let you swing big Newtonian scopes around the sky to bring people big and bright images of the solar system and deep sky objects at a fraction of the price. Yeah, at 98, he certainly had a good innings, but his legacy continues, as I think most of the major astronomy equipment manufacturers have a Dobsonian model in their range now. Mm. Um, And I know John here at Awesome Astronomy will certainly mourn his passing. He's not just a fan of the Dob, but he's a builder of the type of scope as well. So... Can we round off the news with something happier? Yeah, okay then. The Chinese Chang'e 3 rover's been finding magnesium, calcium, aluminium and yttrium on the moon. It's probed the surface down to 140 metres. It sent back some lovely lunar panoramas and the lander's telescope has been mapping the constellation of Draco. That's the first real astronomy ever done from the moon using a telescope. And Curiosity and Opportunity are still trundling around Mars with NASA's MAVEN and India's Mars Orbiter mission on their way as we speak. Cassina is still taking breathtaking images every day of the Saturn system that you can see for yourself at saturn.jpl.nasa.gov slash photos slash raw. And the European Space Agency this month decides which mission to award funding to out of the five proposed. Oh, and what missions are being proposed? Ah, well, there's the ECHO mission to explore the characteristics of planets, LOFT to characterise black holes and study ultra-dense matter in the universe, Marco Polo R to collect a pristine sample of an asteroid, there's the STEE quest to test general relativity, explore the boundaries of the quantum world and look for new fundamental constituents in the universe. And finally, there's Plato to look for Earth-sized planets in habitable zones around their stars. How on earth do you pick for the list like that? <laughs> it's an astronomy physics dream shopping list. Why can't we have them all? Uh, right, so what would you like to see get commissioned this month? I've got to say I like the sound of Marco Polo R. Um, although it's very similar to NASA's Osiris Rex mission, um, I'd love to see ESA building more landers. So, yeah, asteroids, they're really fundamental to understanding the solar system. So, I think it's my vote. How about you? Well, although I don't understand them so well, I like the physics kind of missions that open up new avenues of research and lead to those hang on, what's this moments? So, it has to be the Loft mission to study black holes and ultra dense matter, or the STEE quest to examine the quantum world and peer into new constituents for me. Yeah, I have a feeling you'll probably be right. Uh, the last funding round selected a planetary mission in the form of JUICE, mm-hmm. didn't it? So, uh, Which is off to explore Jupiter's moons. Yeah. Um, we currently have ExoMars in the yep. building. And of course, Rosetta's about to reach its big finale. Um, so it's all quite solar system heavy yeah, from ESA, it is, isn't yeah. it? So while there's Gaia, um, I think we may see ESA back a pure science cosmology mission this time around. That's just my feeling. Yeah, well, whichever it is, it's going to be a wonderful oh, mission and we're going to look forward to it anyway, aren't we? All great missions. Okay, so now that's the news dealt with, time to explore the outer reaches of the solar system in our five-minute concept. We should really call it the Edgeworth Belt, or the Leonard Belt, or maybe even the Lentia Belt. All of these astronomers suggested that Pluto was not alone in its remote location first. Leonard and Lentia both suggested that Pluto would turn out to be the first of many such objects, while the Irish astronomer Edgeworth was the first to suggest that, to quote the man himself, the outer region of the solar system beyond the orbits of the planets is occupied by a very large number of comparatively small bodies, smaller even than Pluto, and that occasionally a body wanders from its own sphere and appears as an occasional visitor to the inner solar system. Of course, what Edgeworth is theorising on is the origins of comets. In some ways, the existence of the Kuiper Belt, first observed in 1992, isn't really surprising. 
As our model of the formation of the solar system developed and improved through the 20th century, it became apparent that the asteroid belt was less the remains of a failed planet and more the scarce leftovers of planetary formation in the inner solar system, the total mass of the asteroid belt being just 4% of our own moon. Turning to the gas and ice giants, it perhaps seems logical to us here and now that there would be a volatile ice equivalent to the asteroid belt, just beyond the orbits of the outer planets. Or maybe that just appeals to our inbuilt sense of symmetry and pattern building. What is surprising about it, though, is the apparent mass of stuff out there in this extensive donut-shaped cloud. Models suggest there should be at least 30 Earth masses of volatiles orbiting the Sun between 30 and 55 astronomical units away. That's enough for almost another two Neptunes. Observation, though, gives us a figure of between a thirtieth and a tenth of an Earth mass, enough to make an icy Mars or two. A huge discrepancy, and one that's yet to be explained. The models may be wrong, of course, but perhaps something has cleaned up out there, maybe a passing star, migrating planets, or perhaps four and a half billion years of violent collisions has pulverised much of the mass into a dust small enough for the solar wind to disperse it. When you realise that one of the largest Kuiper Belt objects, Pluto, contains one-sixth the total mass, you realise this is less a cloud and more a very light and highly dispersed sprinkling. We do know where some of the mass went, and for that we need to look at the giant planets and some of the more unusual moons. Triton, in orbit around Neptune, orbits in a retrograde fashion, counter to the rotation of Neptune's rotation. This heavily suggests it is a captured object from, in astronomical terms, the nearby Kuiper belt, and so it is with several of the smaller irregular moons of the outer planets. Phoebe in orbit around Saturn is another example. And what of the comets, as Edgeworth suggested? Is that an answer? Well, in many books on astronomy, the Kuiper belt is listed as the origin of short-period comets, while long-period comets are stated as coming from the even further and still hypothesised Oort cloud, which, by the way, could equally be called the Opic cloud, after another astronomer who lost the publicity battle. But these books are not entirely correct. The Kuiper Belt has three main components, plutoids, classical objects and the scattered disk. Now it's a matter of debate as to whether these are all the Kuiper Belt or should be considered related but separate entities. The plutoids are the traditional Kuiper Belt and are objects in long stable orbits. These have a semi-major axis in the order of 40 astronomical units. While the next group, the classical objects, are also stable and sit generally in orbits with low eccentricity and orbiting about 42 to 45 AU. The comets, though, would appear to be coming from the last group of trans Neptunian objects, the scattered disk. Now this in some ways melds with the first two groups in the Kuiper Belt, but extends out to 100 AU and contains objects in more eccentric and less stable orbits, ripe for little nudges of gravity to send them on a journey into the inner solar system. This is where we find the object that knocked Pluto off its planetary perch, Eris. Eris has a highly eccentric orbit. At its closest, it's 30 AU from the Sun. Right now, it's 96 AU, and along with its moon, Dysonomia, are the furthest known objects in orbit around the Sun. Beyond this, we have the mysterious Oort cloud, potentially the location of much of the Kuiper's missing mass, pushed out there by gravity of the outer planets. At present, we have no real idea. So, where does the name Kuiper come into this? Gerard Kuiper, a Dutch-American astronomer who worked on the Apollo program, well, he too suggested that a disk of debris had formed around the early solar system in much the same way that Edgeworth had suggested a decade earlier. But in an ironic twist, Kuiper's theory suggested that it was no longer there at all, the area swept clean by the gravitational influence of bodies such as Pluto, which at the time was thought to be the size of Earth. The man the belt is named after didn't believe it was there anymore. This is perhaps a demonstration that working on the Apollo program as Kuiper did gets you good publicity. To be fair to Kuiper, he did discover two moons, Uranus's Miranda and Neptune's Nerid, did fantastic work on binary stars and pioneered infrared astronomy. But he wasn't entirely right about the area of the solar system named in his honour, but then really nobody was. Now, if you've been listening to our Awesome Astronomy back catalogue very carefully, you'll have noticed that almost every month, Ralph's News Roundup contains a new discovery or new construction milestone from ESO, the European Southern Observatory. The same people that gave us their 2014 calendar to give away in our Christmas competition, and have sent us some more goodies to give away this month. And that's not because we work for them or are sponsored by them or anything like that, but they're responsible for so much modern astronomy that goes on today. Yeah, if you've ever seen Brian Cox's Wonders of the Universe or 
pretty much any documentary on space or astronomy, the chances are that you'll have seen ESO's gigantic telescopes high up in the Chilean Atacama Desert, where the atmosphere is thinner and they're above the clouds for better views into space. Yeah, they're the telescopes that force documentary makers to take oxygen canisters <laughs> up with them because the air is so thin until they've had time to acclimatise. Yeah, and the facilities are breathtaking up there. They require the combined technological and budgetary efforts of 15 member states to build this cutting-edge equipment at Paranel, La Silla and Shannon Tor in Chile. Yeah, instruments like La Silla observatories with 3.6 metre exoplanet hunting harp scope. The 3.5 metre new technology telescope that first introduced adaptive optics to automatically alter the shape of the mirrors to combat atmospheric shimmering. Then there's the Paranel Very Large Telescope, or VLT, with its whopping 8.2 metre mirror, able to capture objects 4 billion times fainter than the human eye can see. It's like having a Hubble Space Telescope on the ground. <laughs> yeah, and now just completed is the largest ground-based astronomy project in the world, the Atacama Large Millimetre Submillimetre Array, or ALMA which combined makes ESO the most productive observatory in the world. And from these facilities, astronomers from all over the globe collect imagery and data to go into research papers that are then tested by the peer review process to become the scientific knowledge that we rely on for our ever-expanding understanding of the universe. And over the last year here on Awesome Astronomy, we've remarked on the discoveries of new planets outside our solar system, seeing distant and faint objects with their newly completed ALMA array that were impossible before, and observing a distant exoplanet being eaten up by its own expanding sun. But these are just the more sensational news items that came from ESO, and we really could devote a whole show to ESO news and discoveries each month, so that's why we're so delighted that they keep giving us stuff to give away (laughs) to our listeners. Yeah, and they do all this work, and as I said earlier, they're the most productive observatory in the world, and they're still not widely known outside of the astronomy community, so we want to rectify that and show off their hard work. So let's get on with giving away some of their goodies. Let's take a look through what we've got here to give away in this month's competition. So first up, we've got this blue cap that will fit all sizes, and it's got the blue ESO badge on the front of it, so you can pretend to be an astronomer while you're working. Look at that. Or at school. And then we've got the mug. We've got an ESO mug, so you can pretend to be an astronomer while you're drinking your coffee and drinking your tea in the morning. Or your juice. Or your juice. Or water if you're healthy. (laughs) (laughs) And then if I just open up this, let's see what else we've got in here. We've got... Let's see what we've got. We've got... Um, a range of stickers of their various instruments and some of the images they've taken. Um, and likewise, images, those images are just, aren't they? just stunning, stunning, aren't they? Look at and that. There's nowhere else you can get images. They're, they're like the Hubble images, but they're taken in different wavelengths. Oh, so just, just, you just get these stunning, just beautiful. And the same with these postcards. They've they sent a range of their their images on postcards, and they are mm. just unbelievable. And I think really stunning. The book that's also in there. But yeah, the best till last. This is. A book of their work, The Hidden Universe, and it is truly stunning. And that gives a description of how images were taken in various wavelengths using the facilities that they've got at ESO, but it's also got the stunning images to go with them. So it's kind of like educational as well as it's got these (laughs) amazing images that peer deep into the universe and, and show us things that we can't see with our own eyes because it's outside yeah. the available spectrum yeah. of visible light. Really, I want this book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so and it's wrapped in polythene, so I can't, I even, can't look <laughs> even look through it properly. I've seen inside it, but I can't see inside this one. I want it. But somebody is going to get somebody it. Somebody is going to get it. So, as always, it's free to enter the competition. Uh, we'll run that until 20th of March and announce the winner in the April episode. Mm-hmm. Just go to the website, awesomeastronomy.com, and you'll see the link so big that you certainly won't need an 8.2 meter scope to see it. And I want the mug. Yeah, we can't keep any of this. We've got to give it away, give it away, give it away now. Well, to tell us more about the European Southern Observatory from the inside, this month Ralph spoke to Dr. Joe Liske, an ESO astronomer at the extremely large telescope science office in Germany. Hi, Joe. Thanks for joining us on Awesome Astronomy this month. Hi, Ralph. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So as an astronomer at the European Southern Observatory, or ESO, you're far better placed than us to tell people about the unrivaled work that ESO does to help us learn more about the cosmos. So can we start with what ESO is? 
Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, ESO, the European Southern Observatory, is an international organization that does ground-based astronomy. Uh, so essentially, we uh, plan, build and run astronomical observatories. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, three observatories up and running. Uh, that's uh, All of them are sited in Chile, in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, so that's the La Silla Observatory, the Paranal Observatory and um, ALMA, the Atacama a large millimeter array. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so really our job is to uh, plan, build and run these observatories and we do this for the astronomers in our member state countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so the astronomers that are at uh, universities or other research institutions, um, we provide these facilities for them that, so that they can use them for their astronomical research. And you've hinted at the facilities that you have. Can you tell us then what, what instruments do you have to let astronomers explore the skies currently? Sure. So let's start just uh, historically. Our first observatory was the La Silla Observatory in, in Chile. Uh, nowadays, we still have, or ESO still operates uh, two telescopes at that at that site, and that is the, the ESO 3.6 meter. Um, and then we have uh, another four meter class telescope, the, the NTT, the New Technology Telescope, which, as the name suggests, we, we was built to try out some, some new technology, in particular the so-called active optics. Um, there's uh, also a few other small telescopes uh, on La Silla that are being operated by institutes or other uh, states, but not by ESO anymore. Um, so then moving on to the Paranal Observatory, also in Chile. So Paranal Mountain is uh, 2,600 meter high. And there we operate our, our flagship facility. That's the, the very large telescope, the VLT. So the VLT consists of uh, four almost identical telescopes um, of 8.2 meter size. And then there are also uh, four smaller telescopes, the, the so-called auxiliary telescopes. Um, and so each of these four 8.2 meter telescopes by itself is one of the largest telescopes in the world. But the point is um, that you can also combine them and do what, is, what we call interferometry with them. And for that, uh, then you can also um, use the, the smaller auxiliary telescopes. So can you just give us a, an overview of the interferometry and, and what you're able to do with that? Yeah, so the, the colleagues in radio astronomy, they've been doing interferometry for decades. So in interferometry, you're essentially taking the light that you're collecting with two separate telescopes or in the radio case with, with two separate dishes and then um, combining it together. And essentially what that does is it gives you the resolution or the, the, the sharpness of your quote unquote image. You don't really get an image out of it, but, you know. If you could get an image, you would get uh, the the, the uh, resolution of that image would be the resolution of a telescope that has the same size as the largest distance between any of your individual telescopes. And that's got to be a huge help. Exactly. So that allows you to look at uh, stars at the very nearby environments. You can even measure the sizes of stars. The drawback of this is that, at least in optical interferometry, you need extremely bright sources. Uh, so you need a lot of light to be able to do this. So it's not the dim and distant objects, it's the, the brighter objects that you can yeah. see in optical light, but you've seen it with more clarity. That's exactly. So you do it in optical and, and especially also in the, in the near infrared so, um, wavelength sets where we do the, the interferometry in there. It's just technically, it's much more challenging, much more difficult to do it there as opposed to the radio. That's why they already were able, the radio astronomers were already able to do this decades ago and we've you know we're we're doing this now um so yeah you're looking at the very bright objects uh, you know very bright stars and you know some of the very brightest uh, quasars maybe but that's at least for now uh, what, what we can do at the moment that, that's it really but we're very much working on on improving this technology and and uh, opening up uh, the access to to fainter objects so that we can see the more distant and, and fainter objects mm -hmm. and it's not just about your um your vast observatories themselves or telescopes themselves. It's, there's also the cutting edge instrumentation and enabling technologies that ESO developed. Can you tell us what technologies ESO facilities have given us too? I mean, you mentioned earlier about um, active optics. I think that's probably a good place to start, is it? Absolutely, yeah. That's, uh, so that was really one of the um, a breakthrough developments in, in telescope building, really. Um, so the idea, so back in the olden days, telescopes were built uh, very stiff and very he were made very heavy and the idea or the, the reason was of course that as you're tracking an object across the sky uh, a, a telescope will 
deform under its, its own weight, but of course it's also exposed to the elements that meaning you have wind that is shaking the telescope uh, around a little bit. So the solution then really came when, when people said, no, let's stop that. Let's make telescopes very light so they can pretty much flop around, but you allow the telescope to control itself. So essentially uh, what active optics does is that the telescope about once a second while the telescope is actually observing, the telescope checks itself and checks its own image quality, if you will, and then readjusts the shape of its main mirror, or possibly also the location of other mirrors in the in the optical path, readjusts those uh, that shape to uh, to make the image quality as good as it can. But it's marvelous, and this was uh, first done on the on the new technology telescope that I, that I first uh, mentioned earlier. But this was a crucial t- technology to make the step to the um, to the 8 and 10 meter class telescopes that are the, the largest telescopes around today. Yes, and we can see the, those wonderful images of the telescopes that, that ESO put out where they're shining laser beams up into the sky. Right, so that moves then on to the, to the next set of technology. So what, what I talked about just now was the active optics. Mm-hmm. Um, and then going beyond that, there is something called adaptive optics. Mm-hmm. And essentially, it's a very similar principle. So the telescope again uh, checks its image quality in real time. But now the idea is to compensate for the image distortions that are caused by the Earth's atmosphere. So as your listeners, I'm sure, are aware, you know, if you stand in your backyard and you look at the, uh, at the stars, you see these stars twinkling, right? And, but that twinkling, of course, has nothing to do with the stars. That twinkling is caused by turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere, mm-hmm. and, you know, that, what astronomers call seeing. Um, now, for us, of course, that's, uh, for all astronomers, that's a real uh, pain in the neck, the seeing, uh, because it just um, makes our images less sharp than what they actually could be given the size of our telescopes. Yeah. And so to try, try and get rid of this, we use this adaptive uh, optics technology where, again, you have a mirror and your light pass somewhere and you, again, modulate the shape of the mirror. Uh, but this time you don't do it once a second. You do it hundreds or even a thousand times per second because that's the time scale in which the turbulence in the atmosphere operates. Um, and the idea is simply to take out that twinkling, to take out those image distortions that are caused by the Earth's atmosphere. Again, you're doing this in real time while the observations are going on. This is not a post-processing step. Uh, this is happening in real time. And how close do we think that gets to recreating the conditions of space-based telescopes? Well, that gets very close. It gets very close. And if we move on to one of the hottest topics in astronomy at the moment, um, you have the HARPS equipment there to look for exoplanets. That's right. So the HARPS uh, spectrograph um, is a uh, a spectrograph that is currently operating on the venerable old 3.6 meter telescope that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So what that spectrograph does is um, it it takes spectra of objects, of stars, for example, and in these spectra you can see reasonably sharp um, absorption lines. And what HARPS is really good at doing is, is, is to measure the the velocities or the wavelengths and therefore the velocities of these of these lines and so what that allows you to do it allows you to see whether a given star is actually wobbling backwards and forwards as a result of the gravitational pull of a planet that may or may not be orbiting uh, that star. Mm -hmm. So that was the technique that was uh, first used to discover the first exoplanets around uh, a normal star, at least uh, back in 1995. And it is that same group that made that original discovery that uh, built the HARP spectrograph and that is now operating on our 3.6 meter telescope. And that is incredibly successful in finding new uh, extrasolar planets. Mm-hmm. I, I love the fact that you call a two-meter telescope small. I think our listeners will appreciate <laughs> the irony in that. Yes. <laughs> so looking to the future, there's always something exciting on the horizon for ESO. So when you've already got the very large telescope, what's next? Right. Uh, it won't surprise you to hear that next is the extremely large telescope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Who came <laughs> up with that names. name? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I, uh, I really don't know. So, yeah, so the, the EELT is going to be uh, is our next big uh, project for a, uh, uh, the, the next generation of optical and infrared telescope. And the idea is to build a, a, a 39 meter telescope. So this is a a telescope with a 39 meter primary mirror. Uh, So with that size, it will be and will probably remain for many decades uh, by far the largest optical and infrared telescope uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. So the design and the planning for this is all done. 
um, the project is also approved within within ESO, and uh, so the the plan is really to start with the construction this year. But this year, what we're planning to do is to actually to prepare the mountain where we want to build this new telescope. So again, this is going to be in Chile on a on a mountain called Cerro Amazonas, and so this is a, a mountain 3,000 meters high, and there we need to blow off about 20 meters off the top of the mountain. We need to uh, build a road up there and a pro, you know a proper road that can carry heavy equipment and uh, a construction camp down the bottom of the, at the bottom of the the mountain. Then uh, the time of construction will be about roughly 10 years. Um, so you know, at some time, and hopefully in 2024, we'll have first light for, for this new uh, big telescope. And, and what are the specific areas of astronomy that it'll be able to explore beyond the capabilities of current telescopes? Well, uh, so I guess the question that you need to ask yourself, first of all, is why do astronomers want bigger telescopes in the first place? What, what, what does it do for me to have a bigger telescope? Well, number one, very simple, uh, the bigger the telescope, the larger the light collecting area, and so the more light I can see I can collect per unit time. And uh, so that just means I can see uh, fainter objects, and that in turn means I can either see more distant objects or I can see this, the same objects as before at the same distance, but going down to uh, fainter intrinsic luminosities. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the science goals uh, that we have, or that you know, astronomy in general has at the moment, is trying to locate and observe the very first generation of galaxies that were formed in the very early universe. Uh, we've seen some very distant galaxies already uh, with the VLT. Um, some of those are uh, so far away that their light has taken more than 13 billion years to get to mm -hmm. us. Um, so they are very far indeed, but we can tell that those are not the first galaxies to have existed. There must have been a, a pre previous generation of stars that we'd like to see. So that's one of the things that you want to do with the, with the ELT. And so the, the second reason we want to build a bigger telescope is because it increases the resolution of the telescope. So you know the sharpness of your images increases linearly with the diameter of your telescope. And that, of course, is interesting to uh, resolve, to better resolve objects, to see inside them, or to better, better be able to separate two objects that are very nearby on the sky. Prime example is an exo extrasolar planet that is very close to its parent star. Mm -hmm. right? If you imagine yourself, you get on a spaceship and, and fly out a few light years and then turn around and look back at the Sun-Earth uh, system, you know, what do you see? You see a really bright spot, the Sun, and then you see a really, really dim a uh, tiny little dim spot, the Earth, which is very, very close to the to the bright star. So it's a little bit like trying to see, you know, if you if you imagine you took a little LED and put it next to a stadium floodlight, just a few centimeters next to it, and then drive 200 kilometers away, and then try to see that little <laughs> LED in the glare of that stadium floodlight. You know, this is a tough job, but that's actually a reasonably accurate description of what we're trying to do when we're trying to di take direct images of extrasolar planets, or especially uh, uh, when we're talking about Earth-like or uh, you know, potentially habitable uh, planets. So that is one of the other key science areas where we hope we are going to progress in leaps and bounds with the help of the ELT. And what sort of uh, analysis are you able to do with that? Like the James Webb Space Telescope, are you hoping to be able to take a spectra of the atmospheres of some of those planets? Yes, absolutely. That's the that's the idea. Why do we want to do that? Is because you want so you can uh, analyze the contents and uh, of of this atmosphere. And of course, the ultimate goal here is to be able to say whether whether you can find bio so-called biomarkers in these atmospheres, meaning uh, combinations of molecules and uh, uh, and gases that would. Uh, allow you to say something on whether there might be biological life on the surface of that planet. So, for example, we know on Earth that the emergence of life on Earth has, has dramatically altered uh, the uh, composition of the of the atmosphere. Um, uh, photosynthesis has has really oxygenized the the atmosphere, um, but also uh, things like methane and uh, water in the atmosphere. Those are the kinds of things that you would look for in these extrasolar uh, planets to. Um, see if you can find some hint for extrasolar life, uh, extraterrestrial life, sorry. <laughs> well, that, that just sounds incredibly exciting. It's a shame we're going to have to wait a decade for that. Yes, absolutely. So this is uh, definitely an, an extremely exciting uh, science and an extremely exciting time. And we know quite well what it is that we need to do. It just takes some time and takes a little more, a bit more technological development um, to make all of that, uh, all of those things happen. But I'm reasonably convinced that um, you know in my lifetime I will see the headline that you know extraterrestrial life has been 
has been discovered. You know, it's not going to be that easy. It's not going to be that clear cut. You know, when you do see the right combination of uh, of molecules and so on in, in one of these atmospheres, then the game is going to be that you're going to have to exclude all non-biological origins mm -hmm. uh, of that combination. So, you know, then the geophysicists are going to come in and say, oh, but it could be, you know, the, the uh, geological evolution of that planet could have been like such and such and such, and that could have produced a similar mm -hmm. signature. So that's going to be the game. So it's, you know, it's going to be difficult to make a clear cut, uh, 100%, yes. yes, I'm 100% sure statement that there is, life on that planet but within or i'm pretty sure that within our lifetime uh, we're going to get a statement like that it's, it's interesting what you were saying there about these biomarkers because we see methane and water existing in the atmospheres of other planets that we know don't contain life or we suspect don't have life are there any particular biomarkers you think that would be a kind of smoking gun it's not that simple i don't think it's clear cut the experts haven't fully agreed on what combination of biomarkers would really uh would be the smoking gun. So, I mean, oxygen is certainly something, uh, or ozone, uh, water, methane, you're perfectly right, methane, for example, exists on Mars and Venus as well, but it's the combination with water and, and, o and ozone and oxygen in the atmosphere mm -hmm. that, uh, that does it, or that distinguishes Earth from Mars and, and Venus, for example. It's the accumulation but, of various biomarkers in the right combination. Exactly, it, yeah. exactly. It's the right combination in the right amounts that, that, that does it. But as far as I know, maybe somebody will correct me on this, but as far as I know, uh, the, even the experts haven't fully agreed on what you know precisely would constitute the smoking gun okay so finally the question that we ask all our guests that are involved in astronomy research if there was one thing that you could personally discover about the universe what would it be well um this is slightly strange because what I want to do what I really want to do uh with the with the ELT is um actually to do an experiment which isn't per se going to discover anything it's rather a, a confirmation but it's a particular type of confirmation so let me explain so you know back in the 1920s uh, it was discovered that the universe expands mm -hmm. right um, what, what I would really like to do is I would actually like to watch the universe expanding so the way we do, yeah, this sounds weird. I know, but it sounds cool. <laughs> so, so the way we know that the universe is expanding is because we can take spectra of distant galaxies and we just, you know, we can measure the wavelengths of certain lines and we can identify those lines that they belong to hydrogen or magnesium or something else. And we see that these lines are, are red shifted. They're shifted to the red part of the spectrum, and so that tells us that the universe is actually expanding. So, what I would like to do is actually to watch these uh, galaxies that are receding from us. Um, change their recession velocities over a human time scale okay so because there's mat because the universe is not empty because there's matter uh, uh, in the universe the the expansion speed of the universe is not a constant it changes as a function of time and what i want to do is over a time scale of say 10 or 20 years i want to see that expansion rate actually change in real time quote unquote uh, so over the time scale of, of 10 or 20 years or so and so what, to do that, what you have to do is you have to measure the redshifts of, uh, of objects and you have to measure them extremely precisely. And then you come back 10 or 20 years later, measure those redshifts again. And if you've done this precisely and accurately enough, then what you will find is that the, that redshift has ever so slightly changed. And what that will then uh, allow you to do is to actually reconstruct uh, the expansion history of the universe. So that telling you what the uh, expansion speed was as a function of time throughout the evolution of the universe. And so that's extremely interesting to do because, uh, um, as you may have heard, uh, you know, the universe, the, uh, the expansion of the universe is in fact accelerating. And uh, we think that has something to do with an exotic thing that we call dark energy. Uh, so, uh, this you know very fundamental to to physics, and this is what the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics was given to. Um, so everyone and their dog in cosmology right now is trying to measure as, uh, to the expansion history of the universe to try and say more about what this mysterious dark energy might be. And what I would like to do is I would make such a would like to make such a measurement of the expansion history of the universe to make this in a in a completely direct and uh, model independent way and as I said, in real time. So this would be the first real time uh, cosmological observation. So you, know, you, you essentially observe something, a property about the universe that is actually changing over a time scale of 10 or 20 years. So that's, you, so that's an observation rather than an inference of dark energy. Precisely. 
well, well, not of dark energy so much, but of the of the, the accelerated of the accelerated expansion. And then from from that, you can infer something about uh, uh, dark energy. Well, I wish you every success with that, and I look forward to seeing the outputs in what 2030, 2035. That's right. <laughs> so it's uh, a long term uh, thing, which I may have to pass on to. <laughs> Uh, PhD students, but <laughs> we'll see if I see the end of this. <laughs> well, that's a great place to end. And thanks so much for uh, shedding us some light on the work of ESO and what's coming up in the future and also cosmology as well. Been a pleasure. Dr. Joe Liska, thanks for speaking with us on Awesome Astronomy this month. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, it's time for you to take control and pose those questions that puzzle you on the way to Venus, walking on the Milky Way, or generally make you wonder about the universe at large. So we begin with a question from Darren Knight in Cambridgeshire, and he says, I have a question regarding Mercury. How can a planet so close to the Sun have temperatures colder than minus 100 degrees? That's a good question. It is a good question, and it does seem like a bit of a puzzle, doesn't it? Mm. How come Mercury gets colder than Earth, Venus, and even Mars, despite being the closest planet to the Sun? Mm. Sounds like a bit of a paradox. Well, Mercury is a fascinating planet. It's so often overlooked. It's dismissed as a slightly large copy of the Moon. Um, There's a massive iron core. It's the largest core relative to the total size of any planet. Um, Its orbit is the only one that can't be accurately described by Newtonian laws. Um, We've discovered volatiles on its surface. Um, It's a strange and enigmatic place. So temperatures range from minus 173 degrees Celsius to plus... 427 degrees Celsius. It, it, it's bizarre. The poles, though, always below minus 90. A crazy place. So why the amazing temperature ranges? It's a three-part answer, and it's all linked. The first thing to point out is lack of any meaningful atmosphere. Um, there is a tenuous form of atmosphere called an exosphere, but it's constantly lost to space through the inability of Mercury's weak gravity to hold on to it. And the solar wind is, is, is constantly stripping it away. Um, The other three rocky planets all have atmospheres of varying qualities, but all share an insulating ability that governs temperature, um, especially on the night side of the planet. Earth nights, while cooler than the day, are not substantially colder in the big scheme of things. This leads to the next part of the answer, the length of the Mercurian day, which itself is another oddity about the planet. It rotates three times for every two orbits, but because of how this appears relative to the position in the orbit, you would only see one sunrise and one sunset on Mercury every two Mercurian years, i.e. a day lasts 176 Earth days. This means that Mercury's uninsulated night-facing side is sitting exposed to part three of the answer, uh, which is the cold of space, emitting radiation into the almost absolute zero vacuum for around an entire orbit of the Sun. It is only the stored heat from the time facing the sun and a tiny amount of effort from the exosphere that keeps the temperature from dropping near absolute zero. As for the cold at the poles, well, that's a bonus part four to this answer. Mercury is one of the smallest axial tilts of any planet at a mere 2.11 degrees, which means that the poles don't get exposed to direct sunlight and craters there are permanently in shadow. Such is the stability of cold temperatures there that quite large volumes of water ice have been discovered in the order of... 10 to the 14, 15 kilograms. So in summary, space is cold, Mercury has no protective atmosphere, and its day and night are very long, while its poles are protected by a very small axial tilt. Okay, I hope that goes some way to solving the paradox for you, Darren, and I hope you are one of the tiny minority, even among astronomers, that have actually seen the innermost planet. Now the next question is from Francis Moore in London. Hi, I've been wondering, we keep on getting on TV these pictures of the oldest light in the universe and the residue of the light of the Big Bang and uh, photographs like that that really blow our minds. But I just keep wondering, how do we get those photos? Because I'm sure I'm just being stupid, but that light is obviously going in a completely different direction to us. So how can we see it if it's traveling away from us? I'd really like uh, that cleared up for me. Thanks a lot. Well, I wasn't quite sure the angle that Francis was coming from here or what the main cause of his confusion on the subject was, but cosmology is such a fascinating and baffling subject, so I asked him to email me with his thoughts. And after exchanging a few emails, Francis is taking the logical assumption that we're closer to the centre of the universe than the stars and galaxies we try to observe. And the expansion of the universe means that they're moving away from us faster than the light can travel, so we shouldn't be able to see them. And they're both logical assumptions, but they're not what observation shows us. 
The Big Bang model tells us that the universe started 13.8 billion years ago from a point smaller than an atom. Um, one of the consequences of this is that we're no more the centre of the universe than anything else. Or equally, everywhere and everything within the universe has just as much claim to be the centre of the universe as anywhere else. Got that? So, the universe isn't just expanding away from us in every direction, but expanding from every point in the universe equally. So far, so good. Now, there are probably better examples than mine. I've heard cakes being baked and inflated balloons used before, but if the universe were a rubber sheet being pulled apart, it'd have to be pulled equally in all directions, and any spots or imperfections on the rubber sheet could be seen as distant galaxy clusters moving away from each other. But that doesn't answer your question. In fact, it suggests that you're right to think that other stars and galaxies should be invisible to us. So why isn't this the case? Well, in its simplest terms, it's a case of the speed of this expansion versus the speed of light. Now, right after the Big Bang, it appears that the universe doubled in size more than 100 times in just a fraction of a second. We call this inflation, and it expanded the universe faster than the speed of light, but only for that fraction of a second. After this, it continued expanding, but at a much more leisurely rate. Now, that's difficult to imagine, and it doesn't break the laws of physics like you think it would. Information, and light is information, can't travel faster than the speed of light, by definition, but the fabric of space-time can expand faster than the speed of light if there's enough force to cause it to happen. And our best guesses at what that force could be was the subject of Paul's five-minute concept in episode 17. But think of it like this. Imagine you're walking or driving along a road and you can't get to your destination because the road in front of you is expanding faster than you're travelling. Now, because this scenario seems to have happened 13.8 billion years ago, it was before stars and galaxies formed, and therefore couldn't make them all whiz away, never to be seen again at that point. And that's because it was 380,000 years after this inflation period that the universe cooled down enough to form neutral atoms of hydrogen, helium, and a bit of lithium, and it was a few hundred million years after that that these atoms coalesced to form the first stars, which in turn coalesced to form galaxies. So... By the time the building blocks of stars and galaxies came along, the expansion rate of the universe was much more sedate. The universe we see now is still expanding though, just at a much slower rate than the burst of inflation. But the current rate of expansion is getting faster over time. It seems the more the universe expands, the more stuff causing it to expand arises. And while we have theories for this, such as dark energy, we don't understand this at all yet. But crucially to this question, it doesn't affect the stars in our galaxy today. And in the future, it'll only affect other galaxy clusters. Well, from our perspective anyway. And this is because for every megaparsec of space, or three and a quarter million light years, that piece of space is expanding at 71 kilometres a second. Now that sounds fast, but the gravitational attraction of hundreds of galaxies clustered together around us keeps them inching closer each and every day. But the next megaparsec of space, and the one after that, and the one after that, they all expand by an extra 71 kilometres a second, and another 71 kilometres a second, and another. So the further away a galaxy cluster sits from any given other galaxy cluster, the more they move apart. And this is measured in redshift, the way the light we receive from them is getting stretched out as it moves away from us, like the pitch of a police siren lowers as the sound waves get stretched out as it speeds away from us. And as we know the expansion rate of each megaparsec of space, this redshift also tells us the distance to a galaxy too. Now, in about 2 trillion years, we expect the expansion of space between our cluster of local galaxies and our neighbouring supercluster to have accelerated to the point where the light from other galaxy clusters can't reach us anymore. Now, using the rubber sheet analogy that I used earlier, if your hands holding the sheet are two distant galaxies and a ball bearing on the sheet represents the speed of light, it's like pulling your hands apart faster than the ball can roll. But I want to emphasise that this expansion only affects the space between galaxy clusters. The stars, planets, gas and dust that make up galaxies are packed densely enough to overcome the expansion of the universe, hold together and eventually coalesce themselves into large elliptical galaxies. But as for the 10 million or so other galaxy superclusters that we're not part of, well, they'll whiz away from us, never to be seen again. So, ignoring the fact that Earth won't be habitable when the Sun nears the end of its life in 4 billion years, an astronomer will be able to see stars, star clusters and nebulae in the Milky Way for at least 100 trillion years, and that's when stars will stop forming. But around the same time the Sun extinguishes any life on Earth, 
Andromeda and the Milky Way will begin to merge. Eventually, most of the nearby galaxies would like to observe the Leo Triplet, the Pinwheel Galaxy, Triangulum, M81 and M82, and many others will all merge with us in Andromeda. But after two trillion years, all we'll see is these galaxies in our local supercluster of galaxies that are either merged with us or in the process of merging with us. All other galaxies will have been carried away from sight by a universe that's expanding faster than the light from those distant galaxies can reach us. Bleak, but awesome. So, before we finish, um, it's worth mentioning that in the UK, from the 1st to the 8th of March, it's National Astronomy Week. Yeah, and there's going to be events held up and down the country to promote astronomy, get people interested in astronomy and get new people involved in the hobby of astronomy. And we're no different to that. The Awesome Astronomy team, Paul and me and Damien and John, are also going to be getting together to promote some new events. We're going to have some events around London to try and get people looking through telescopes that wouldn't do ordinarily. So we're going to go to different sites around London and get people looking through telescopes. That's right. If you look out on our Facebook and our Twitter feeds and on our website, you should find out about our pop-up events that are going to happen across the capital. So come along and look through some telescopes with us. Yep. Well, that's all we have time for this month. Don't forget to enter our ESO competition by visiting our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com and be in with a chance of winning these fantastic prizes. Remember, if you were looking for our Sky Guide, this is now available as a separate podcast that you can download from the usual sources. If you like the show, please do leave us a review on iTunes and listen out for us and all the other excellent astronomy shows on 365 Days of Astronomy. Look out for next month's Sky Guide a few days before the start of March on iTunes, the Awesome Astronomy YouTube channel on our website, www.awesomeastronomy.com, and we'll have the main show ready for the usual start of the month. If you want to leave us any comments or questions for the show, you can tweet them to at awesomeastropod, post them on the Awesome Astronomy Facebook group, or email us at theshow at awesomeastronomy.com. So until next time, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced by Ralph Wilkins, Paul Hill, Damian Phillips and John Wildridge and is free to distribute for educational purposes. Music is courtesy of Star Salzman. For more astronomy news, views, help and advice, visit our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com You can join in the astronomy discussion on our Facebook group and you can follow us on Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod. We invite your questions to read out on the show. You can send them to us via Facebook, Twitter, or by email at the show at awesomeastronomy.com. We thank you very much for listening. From Cydonia Base, end of transmission. And the International Space Stations. But so far... I said international space stations. There's only one, isn't there? Is, this, is there still just one? Uh, there's just one. Can you check that? Yeah. Can you check that? There's only one international space check station. That. <laughs> there is. Brilliant. What? <laughs>